Well, my wife, Lorene, and I have, uh, as many of you know, four adult sons. Uh, Their ages are 33, 31, 28, and 26. Three are married. And so we now are the proud grandparents of three grandchildren. Here we are uh, back at Christmas time with all three of them. Uh, The little boy in the front is one year old. His name is Kish. He belongs to our older son, Jordan, and his wife, Hanukkah. They live in Indianapolis. And the two little girls are Emery, the older one, and Eden. And they're the daughters of Mike and Gianna, our third son, and they are part of our Mill Creek campus. Now, Emery is three years old, and she loves Pastor Sterling uh, at Mill Creek. And like many young parents, uh, our son and daughter-in-law are teaching her how to pray. Um, She loves to pray before meals. Uh, She will fold her hands and then wait till everybody around the table has also folded their hands. And if you have not yet folded your, your hands, she will stare at you <laughs> until you do. And then she'll begin. And she always prays the same way, the way her mom and dad have taught her. Dear God, you are so big and so strong. Thank you for our food. And then she'll thank God for every person sitting around the table by name, if she knows their name. Thank you for mommy and daddy. Thank you for Edie, that's her little sister. And for Amama and Papa B, that's our grandparent names. And anybody else. And then she says, in Jesus' name, Amen. She's got an enthusiastic ending to her prayers. But sometimes, if she's in a bit of a hurry to get to her mac and cheese or her chicken nuggets, she will kind of speed things up. It'll be like this. Dear God, you are so big and so strong. Thank you for our food and dooby 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 dooby. Amen. (laughs) I saw a survey recently that said, despite declining church attendance in America and Today, in America, only 30% of the people say they go to church at least once a month. But despite declining church attendance, a full 61% of Americans say they pray regularly. 55% say they pray daily. And I would think that all of us in this room would say that we also pray. And everybody watching online, we pray. Maybe you pray daily. Maybe you pray multiple times every day. But I also think that many of us sometimes have questions about prayer. We wonder about it. How should we pray? Should we fold our hands? Should we kneel down? Are we, am I doing it right? How does it work? What do we pray for? What is prayer anyway? Like Paige said, today we're in the second week of a four-part series called Praying with Paul. We're taking the month of January looking at four prayers that we find in the letters of the Apostle Paul in our New Testament. Now let me give you Just a little background, a refresher on Paul himself. This is one of the um, oldest known images of the Apostle Paul. It dates to about the third century. Uh, It was found just recently in the catacombs of Rome. It's It's a little blurry, but it's a mosaic. Paul, from what we know, was born and raised in a devout Jewish family. Uh, By the time he was a young adult, he was quite a formidable scholar, uh, known for his knowledge of Jewish scriptures, for the law of Moses, and he was a zealous defender of both. And by the time the Jesus movement began to pick up momentum in the year or two after the resurrection, Paul believed it was his sacred responsibility before God Uh, to do everything he could to eliminate this dangerous heresy of the Jesus followers, the Jesus people. He participated in the stoning death of Stephen, the first martyr. You see that story in the book of Acts, chapter 7. He played a lead role in chasing down, interrogating, imprisoning, and worse, the followers of Jesus. And it was while he was on the way to do more of that that he was encountered by the living, risen Jesus on the road to Damascus. And in that encounter, he realized that not only was Jesus not a false prophet, he was the actual fulfillment of all the scriptures, all the law, and all the prophets, that he was the crucified and risen Messiah of God. And from that point forward, Paul knew the purpose of his life was to preach the gospel of Jesus to the Gentile world, and we are descendants of that calling, if you are not of Jewish descent, you're a Gentile. And Paul preached to the Gentile world. Then he went on planting churches all around the ancient world, and one of them was in the city called Ephesus. Now, evidence says that Paul wrote this letter in about 56 or so AD, which is just 20 years or so after the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. So if those of you who are old enough to remember 9-11, 
it's about that long ago that Paul's talking about the resurrection of Jesus, so it was recent enough memory to make it real and close. Now, he's writing from prison. Some scholars think he's writing from prison in Rome, but more recently, scholars believe he was actually in prison in Ephesus itself, suffering a great deal physically and spiritually at this time. Now, Ephesus was one of the great cities of the ancient world. Uh, it, was, it was in uh, what we call Turkey today, one of the great cities of the Roman Empire. Uh, it was known for the Temple of Artemis, which was uh, one of the great pagan temples of its day. Uh, and today, if you visit that site, only one single column remains, and you can see it right there to the right. Ephesus also boasted an amphitheater, a huge amphitheater, that seated up to 25,000 people at the same time. Uh, this is a theater that's actually mentioned in Acts chapter 19 when a riot happened here and Paul uh, had to run for his life from a mob angry because his preaching was causing people to buy less of the little silver pagan statues to worship and he created the quite a scene there. I took this picture actually when I had the chance to visit Ephesus in 2019. So today we move on to the second prayer Paul prays in the letter to the Ephesians, and it comes to us in Ephesians chapter 3, and we'll put these verses on the screens, or you can look in your Bible app or your Bible. Ephesians 3, I'm going to begin in verse 14. Paul writes, Paul prays, for this reason, and Paul says that because he's connecting this prayer to what he's just said, that God is done do, doing something new in and through Jesus. He's bringing Gentiles and Jews together in one new body, the church, and through the church, changing the world. For this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I want you to know Paul's beginning to prayer, his posture. He says, I kneel before the Father. He's imitating Jesus. Jesus in the Lord's Prayer said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. So Paul knows who he's addressing. He's not talking to the big guy upstairs. He's talking to the Father from whom every family on heaven and earth gets his name. Now he moves on to what he's going to pray. Verse 16, I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. I hope somewhere in your mind right now you're saying, wow. Wow, have I ever, even once, prayed like that? This is a man who lived 2,000 years ago, who is in prison, who has never seen an electric light, a computer, a car, and this prayer comes out of him when he's writing a letter to people he cares about. Now, as I study often, I will take the passage and put it on my computer, and I'll start to go through the passage, reading carefully and outlining in different colors things that I need to either study more deeply or that might become the outline for a sermon. And I put them in red or blue, and I started doing that with this passage and before I knew it, almost every word was highlighted in red. And I thought to myself, this is going to be a really long sermon. But like glorious riches, power, spirit, inner being, that Christ may dwell in your hearts. How wide and long and high and deep is his love. The fullness of God. And it just goes on and on. I just want to pull out three main things that might help shape how we think of prayer and how we pray. First, we see here a prayer for the strength of the spirit. A prayer for the strength of the Spirit. I grew up around prayer. Many of you know my dad was a pastor for like 65 years. He and my mom were both devoted to prayer. So prayer was just in the language and in the, in the air that I breathed growing up. We prayed before mealtimes. My mom and dad prayed with us before school. They prayed with us at bedtime. Uh, my wife and I tried to continue this practice of bookending prayer, beginning and ending each day with prayer uh, with our boys as they grew up. And one of the clearest memories I have of my mother praying uh, at bedtimes was that she would 
almost always uh, include a prayer uh, for my future wife. Uh, she would, of course, want me to know that uh, if she'd pray that I would know Jesus loves me and that God had a plan for my life. But she made sure to ask the Lord to begin preparing then the young lady who would one day at the right time come into my life to be a, 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 a godly and loving wife, the one he had for me. And I'd be like the whole time thinking, Mom, I'm 12, you know. <laughs> but she kept praying that prayer. I know she did, and I'm beyond grateful that she did. Verse 16, and I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Take a look at that phrase, out of his glorious riches. What does Paul mean? What are the glorious riches of God? I saw a list a few weeks ago uh, posted online of the world's richest people. And maybe you're aware that the entrepreneur Elon Musk who founded uh, Tesla and SpaceX and owns Twitter or X, is now considered the richest man in the world. His net worth is estimated at $245 billion. Now, how much is that, you might ask? I was curious. Elon Musk could spend $1 million a day for how long? Just take a guess. I'm cheating because I did the math. 600 years and still have plenty of millions left over. That pretty much qualifies him as being rich, I think. But what are the glorious riches that Paul is talking about? If we go back just to the first chapter of Ephesians, here's the passage we read where he explains it. He says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace. And there's a hint which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with, here it is, the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. There it is. The riches of God are the riches of his glorious grace. Grace is the gift of God purchased by and anchored in the blood of Christ, Paul says. So all of Elon Musk's $245 billion cannot buy what the blood of Christ gives for free. Grace that forgives sin, grace that chooses us, adopts us into his family, grace that is lavished on us, poured out in endless, abundant supply. I imagine like a, a Niagara Falls of grace, the glorious riches of God. Back to verse 16 again. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. Three words or phrases, power, spirit, and inner being. Power is the Greek word dunamis, from which we get our English word dynamite. So what kind of power is Paul talking about? Well, consider by comparison the power of the sun, for example. Now, I'm not an astrophysicist, so I had to look this up. Here's just one little factoid about the sun. Did you know that every second of every minute of every day, the sun, which is 93 million miles away, produces 650,000 times as much energy as the entire earth needs in a year? I'll say that again. Every second, the sun produces 650,000 times as much energy as the earth consumes in an entire year. And on top of that, scientists believe that the sun contains enough power to continue burning for at least five billion years. That's power. But that's no match for the power Paul's talking about in this prayer. Last week, Paul prayed that we would know his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead. Paul's talking about the power of resurrection, the power to make alive that which was dead. This past Friday, I did a graveside service for a family at our South Street campus. 
and stood with the family in front of a hole in the ground that the casket would go down into. You could shine the sun on that graveyard for the next thousand years and won't raise that body back to life. But the Bible says there is one who can and will do exactly that. Next word is spirit. So Paul's saying the conduit of that power to bring life from death is the Holy Spirit. Back again to Ephesians chapter one, Paul describes what the Holy Spirit's role is. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with the seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. Now the Holy Spirit, I recognize, is a bit of a mystery. We probably don't teach or talk about the Holy Spirit enough. But what you see here is that Paul is telling us that the Holy Spirit is part of the whole deal. The Holy Spirit is promised to all those who believe. It's not some sort of extra spiritual experience given to the, the super spiritual, those who go to church more or pray more, no. Paul says, when you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. That means if you put your faith in Jesus, the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity of God, lives in you. Years ago, I had a friend at church here who's since moved away who um, told me, and he'd grown up in a different faith tradition, and he told me that most of his life he thought of religion uh, like a car that sat in this driveway. A nice car, well-built, solid, nice tires, good engine, but it didn't go anywhere. It just sat in his driveway because it had no gas in the tank. And then he said, but when he heard and believed the gospel, when he came into personal faith in Jesus, when he experienced the riches of God's grace, when he received a new heart through the forgiveness of sin, new identity by being adopted into God's family, that the Holy Spirit then filled his heart, his mind, his life with a power that transformed dead religion into a dynamic personal relationship that changed everything. So what he said, in essence, is the Holy Spirit was the gas in the tank of his faith. Or if you're an electric car driver, it's the battery that makes everything go. Third, Paul says all of this takes place in what he calls the inner being. Now what's that? That's just what we call the heart, the soul, or the self, that which makes you, you. Paul's talking about the part of you that was created to experience and know God. Now what I notice here is that Paul's primary concern was not external things, not material or physical needs. It's fine to pray for those things, but that just wasn't his focus here in his prayer. He's concerned mostly about spiritual strength, a power that works from the inside out of our lives. And now he moves seamlessly from the Holy Spirit to talking about Jesus. Verse 16 again, I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit and your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Now you may be thinking, well, he was just talking about the Holy Spirit, and all of a sudden it's Jesus? Which is it? Who is it? Well, for Paul, it's both. He's saying that it's the power made available to us by the Holy Spirit allows Christ to dwell in our hearts. Now that word dwell is a word that just means to make oneself at home. To make oneself at home. That Christ would make his home in your hearts. Now, have you ever known someone, maybe a great aunt or a grandma that kept uh, all her living room furniture covered in plastic? You know, you go in, and you're not sure if you should sit down or not. The plastic squeaks when you sit down. You're not sure. You never quite feel at home when all the furniture is covered in plastic. And I hope I'm not talking about anybody here today. I really hope I'm not. But Paul's imagining that our inner being, that your inner being, your heart is like a house with many rooms. There's a library which is what we think about. There's a dining room, which is what we feed our hearts, what we feed our minds. There's a family room, the central relationships of our lives, and there's a basement or an attic where we hide things that we don't want other people to see. He's saying that Jesus wants to make his home in us, and that means every room of our hearts. 
And if we allow him in, he will always start moving stuff around, start changing things. Sometimes just rearranging furniture a bit, sometimes throwing stuff all the way out. Paul prays that by the power of the Spirit, we would know Christ dwelling in our hearts. Secondly, we see a prayer to know the love of Christ. A prayer to know the love of Christ. One of my formative experiences of prayer happened when I was 25 years old, more than 40 years ago. I still remember it. I'd received a call to ministry a couple years before. I believe God was calling me into some form of ministry, just didn't know what. I was struggling to figure all that out. I was going through graduate school and paying my way by coaching basketball and substitute teaching in middle schools and high schools. And it was a frustrating time. I was single and I couldn't quite see what he was doing. I knew he had called me, but I didn't know what the next step was. And I was getting frustrated with that. It was just taking so long. I just wanted to know, what's, what, do you have, what do you have for me? What do I have to do? Tell me what to do for you. And one night I decided I was going to just pray until I got an answer because I was frustrated. So alone in my apartment that night, I, I began to pray. And I prayed in all the ways I knew how, all the ways I'd learned. You know, I, I said the right words and I begged and asked and beseeched and asked for a direction. Just tell me the next step. What do you want from me? And in the middle of my praying, and I can't quite put it into words even after all these years, I had a surprising thought, more like a, quiet voice in, in the inner being, that part of me. And what the voice said was simply, but very clearly, Brian, use my name, I love you. Now I was surprised because that wasn't the content of prayer. That was not what I was asking for or praying about. And I said sort of back, I know you love me, but I really need to know what step should I take next? How do I get there? And the voice spoke again, Brian, I love you love you. And I said, I know, I know that I can sing Jesus loves me before I can recite the alphabet. You know that, I know that what I need to know is, and the voice, it came again, this time much more firmly. Brian, like stop, I love you. And with that, I began to weep. And I don't cry easily or very often. I had never cried when I prayed before, but I did. <clears throat> Looking back, I think, and that was 40 years ago, and I still remember, what he was teaching me, and I believe it was the voice of the Holy Spirit, is that before he could ask me to do anything, I needed to know and surrender to the greatness of his love. Last week, Pastor Sterling, I heard him preach, and he quoted Pastor Joe, who quoted David Blatt. That's the way our preaching team kind of works. Who said, prayer is primarily not getting things. Prayer is about knowing someone. The way I like to say it is prayer, one of the great blessings of prayer is being loved by God. And here's the thing. It's hard to be loved. It's hard to be loved. Because to be fully loved, you have to be fully known. And that requires a surrender. And I think that's what Paul's talking about here in Ephesians, beginning of verse 17. He says, And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, to know that which is unknowable, unfathomable. Paul uses two images here. First, rooted, which is agricultural, like a tree rooted deep in the soil, and established, which is architectural, like the foundations to a building. But both say the same thing. Everything begins with the love of Christ. Now, I want you to hear this because I believe in our culture today, and even for some of us in the church, people assume that religion works like this. You know, you... You live your life, you do, try to do more good than bad in your life and hope that that earns you, in the final analysis, the love and the favor of God. I think that's what most people assume. No, that's not the gospel. Paul says everything begins with God's grace lavished on you and the vastness of Christ's love. That comes first. Paul had been overwhelmed 
devastated, laid bare by the love of Christ. And he wants us to be overwhelmed as well. That's why he prays that we would have the power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know a love that surpasses knowledge. I think he's borrowing language here from the Psalms. He would have known all the Psalms. Psalm 103, for as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. Paul is using a kind of dimensional language here, like we would use in talking about the size of the ocean or the size of the universe. So I looked up that too. You know, the oceans cover 71% of the earth's surface. The oceans all put together contain 321 million cubic miles of water. Did you know that the highest mountain ranges on earth are underwater? There's so much water on the earth. Or think about the size of the universe. I mentioned earlier our sun is 93 million miles away. It takes light itself eight minutes to travel 93 million miles. Astrophysicists now believe that the known universe is almost 100 billion light years across. Mind-blowing. Paul says the love of Christ for you is greater than that. Thirdly, we see here a prayer to be filled with the fullness of God. Filled with the fullness of God. Years ago, I came across a little poem called Three Dollars Worth of God. Let me read it for you. I would like to buy three dollars worth of God, please. Not enough to explode my soul or disturb my sleep, but just enough to equal a cup of warm milk or a snooze in the sunshine. I don't want enough of God to cause me to love my neighbor or serve the poor or forgive. I want comfort, not new birth. I want a pound of the eternal in a paper sack. I would like to buy $3 of God, please. And I think sometimes that's what we can settle for, or I can settle for. You know, a little encouragement, a little of God's word, a little love, a little prayer, a little Jesus. But Paul, for one, does not want to settle. He doesn't want us to settle either. He writes, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now, what is the fullness of God? We know from other places, Paul writes in the New Testament, he means the fullness God of God is the totality of all that God is. His holiness, his power, his love, his grace, his mercy, his righteousness, all together. But I think specifically, he's talking about what he's already prayed for in this prayer. You're probably wondering what my picture is up here for. I think many times our focus and our prayer is about the glass, the outside of the glass, the externals of our lives. You know, our health, our safety, our circumstances. There's nothing wrong with praying about those things. But Paul is much more concerned about the inside of the glass. He says that you would be filled to the measure of the fullness of God. He's talking about being filled with the Grace, the glorious grace of God that is lavished upon us, being filled with the power of the Spirit that comes and dwells in us, the vastness of the love of Christ for each one of us until it just overflows into an unconquerable hope. Because remember where Paul is as he prays this prayer. He's in prison. He's likely been beaten, stripped of all his earthly possessions, uncertain of his very life. And I think in this prayer we see where Paul found the strength to endure. And he wants his readers, he wants us to know that same power and that same hope. Listen to how he closes this prayer. Verse 20, Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. So here's our invitation for this week. I want you to find this prayer in your personal Bible or in your Bible app. Earmark it. Ephesians 3, verses 14 to 21. 
And I want this to be your prayer this week. Read this every week, every day. I mean, every day of this week. Read it. Read it at least once. I want you to read it twice, actually. The first time you read through this prayer, allow it to be a prayer for you personally. God's word through Paul for you. And then read it again. The second time, read it as a prayer for someone in your life. Maybe for one of your children. Maybe for a family member or a friend. Maybe a work associate. Pray it for Pastor Jeff and Eric. Pray it for each other. Lord, thank you for your word today. Thank you for this prayer. First prayed for people living in a different time in a different place, but people just like us. People who needed to know the riches of your grace lavished on them. People who needed to know the power of your spirit, the vastness of your love for them. And I simply ask that you would encourage each one of us here today through this prayer and that you would teach us to pray like this. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Thank you, Eric, and worship team. Just before the benediction, remind you, as Paige said, on the way out in the lobby, there are generosity boxes if you came prepared to worship through giving today. Thank you so much for your generosity. And our glass room in the lobby is open for prayer between services. If you need to step in there and have a moment of prayer, you're welcome to do that. Receive now today's benediction. Paul's final two verses of the prayer we studied today. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Have a great day.